man has always found companionship in the weirdest of places. Animals, volleyballs, women. But in the late 20th century, we befriended our weirdest companion yet. Computers. These cold calculated machines are the best facsimile of human friendship that we've invented yet. Second only to coming home drunk and talking to your cat. Of course, the road to digital friendship has been fraught with troubles. From corporate failures to infectious malware. From praising Hitler to denying virtual sex. The machines that were meant to make our lives easier often do anything but. This is the dark, stupid history of virtual friends. <laughs> What the hell was that? Has this ever happened to you? Hi, I'm Mini Kudos, and today I've partnered with Geology in order to bring you the solution to all of your face skin problems. They've graciously invited me to their infamous flesh room, of which there's no entrance or exit. It's here that they test their 19 time award winning skin, hair, and body products. Now, if you're anything like me, skincare is something you've always meant to do, but I mean, where do you start? Sure, you could just ask a girl, but every time I do that, my chest starts to hurt and I have to take my medication. Instead, Geology just had me answer a few quick questions about my skin and what I was looking to improve before a personalized package of products showed up at my door. I finally have a skincare routine to fix my dry skin and baggy eyes and I love how easy geology made it to get started. I'm actually really excited to start my skincare journey with geology and if you guys are looking to join me they've hooked me up with an amazing limited time offer. Use code MINIKUDOS70 or scan the QR code on screen in order to save a whopping 70% off their award-winning skincare trial set. That's $50 worth of products for only $15. And you can get up to 50% off any of that cool DLC that you might want to add on. Thanks again to Geology for sponsoring this video. Let's start with the friend that anyone who remembers where they were on 9-11 will know. Bonzi Buddy. This little purple goblin came from a long lineage of low-res cartoon characters, desperate to help you send emails. In the late 90s and early 2000s, home PCs were starting to explode. Except not really, because then nobody would want one. Previously the toys of turbo nerds who were 30 years too early to have Discord as an excuse, PCs had entered the realm of their most bewildered demographic yet, your parents. In a futile attempt to ease the transition from the physical realm to the digital one, designers at Microsoft tried superimposing the familiar over the foreign. To this day, we still use the metaphorical concept of files being placed in folders, but Microsoft took this a step further with Microsoft Bob. A graphical simulation of a house, users could navigate the rooms and open programs like the word processor by clicking on the notepad or incognito mode by clicking the magazine under the bed. To help you navigate this pajama Sam ass world, you were treated to a customizable virtual assistant which defaulted to the dog rover. In addition to helping users navigate this strange off-white cube that their house was burdened with, Microsoft hoped that if one of these characters made the public's micro hard enough, it could be a commercial success in its own right. This wasn't too far-fetched, as the merchandise from famous dehydrated grapes, the California raisins, made more money than the entire worldwide raisin industry, which I'm sure made some raisin farmers feel pretty stupid. To put it bluntly, people hated Bob, and especially its virtual assistants. They would constantly refer to you by your first name with the sort of diligence that an out of touch fast food manager would think is endearing. They were also incessantly naggy, in a way that even someone who requires constant handholding would find annoying. While Bob would only sell 58,000 copies and be discontinued within a year, Microsoft learned from their failings and improved upon it for their next assistant. Clippy was a virtual assistant who was incessantly naggy, constantly hounding you in a way that even someone who requires constant handholding would find annoying. Everyone's favorite circumcision themed helper was based on a tragic misunderstanding of the computers as social actors theory. Believing that humans instinctively interact with computers the same way we do with other humans, Microsoft thought it made sense to have a human-like face to interact with. Of course, since we already interacted with computers the same way we do with other humans, crowbarring in a human face was distracting at best and aggravating at worst. Like the guy at the comic book shop who breathlessly explains his favorite anime to you, Clippy couldn't take a fucking hint and would constantly bug you no matter how many times you told him not to. His nagging was so bad that one of the main selling points of Windows XP is that Clippy was turned off by default, as explained in an official Flash cartoon starring Gilbert Gottfried as Clippy. Hey, you, hit the 
looks like you're writing a letter. Would you like- Beat it. The 2000s were a magical time. After multiple attempts at creating a virtual assistant, Microsoft was shown up by Bonzi Buddy. Clippy's soul would continue to haunt computers the world over, as Bonzi was based on Microsoft Agent, the technology that powered Clippy. Bonzi's avatar was originally a green parrot named Petey, one of the Microsoft Agent default characters who sounds like he should be on to catch a predator. After Petey was arrested trying to meet up with a 13 year old swallow at a beachside property in Florida, they replaced him with their cool Sonic OC, a purple monkey dishwasher named Bonzi. This free piece of software boasted the ability to talk, walk, joke, browse, search, email, and download like no other friend you've ever had. He also keeps you up to date with breaking news, meaning statistically at least one person learned about 9-11 from Bonzi Buddy. Oh, he could even sing. Okay, here goes. Daisy, Daisy. Give me your answer, truth. While Bonzi Buddy was functionally identical to previous virtual assistants, even known for his constant nagging and annoying banter, he had one key difference consent. Much like that U2 album that every iTunes user was gifted a few years ago, even something completely free can be despised when forced on the general public. Clippy and the Microsoft Bob characters were imposed upon you like a baby left on your doorstep that you can't get rid of no matter how hard you try. Conversely, you had to go out of your way to download and install Bonzi Buddy. Now, just because Bonzi needs permission to be let into your home doesn't mean he's helping you email death threats out of the kindness of his heart. It's believed that even if Bonzi Buddy wasn't straight up malware, it was definitely malicious. In a 2002 article about the five major types of spyware, Robertson Barrett notes that Bonzi Buddy serves ads, frequently prompts users for personal information, tracks all usage, deposits icons in the startup folder, system tray, and on the desktop, repeatedly resets the browser homepage to bonzi.com without asking permission, and leaves components behind after users use its uninstall program. It even monitors your internet usage to serve up more relevant ads, which is commonplace today, but quaintly considered intrusive back in 2002. Like those fake download buttons on completely legal download websites, Bonzi would also serve up pop-ups that mimic genuine Windows system messages, informing the user of security alerts. Upon clicking the pop-up, you would be redirected to the Bonzi website, which would then sell your impressionable suspicious parents antivirus software. This resulted in a class action lawsuit against Bonzi by law firm Lukens and Anus. While they originally wanted Bonzi to pay $500 to every user who encountered an ad and $5 per impression served, they eventually settled for much less. It was estimated that they served up over 300 million impressions, which is a lot of purple bananas. Bonzi was forced to pay $170,000 in legal fees, as well as alter their pop-ups to make it clear that they're advertisements and not genuine system messages. This wouldn't be the only legal trouble that Bonzi would encounter. As you can imagine, the cartoon purple gorilla wasn't exactly popular amongst the 35-year-old accountant demographic. Instead, it was often children who were the asymptomatic carriers, infecting their home PCs with the wee bastard. In order to register the software, you had to put in a suspicious amount of personal information, which made it a prime target for copper. Besides an Australian talking about the police, you might have heard about copper from the YouTube kid scandal a few years back. The Children's Online Privacy Protection Act was designed, amongst other things, to stop the little crotch goblins in your life from doxing themselves on the internet. It was discovered that Bonzi Buddy was collecting a lot of personal information from children under the age of 13 without their parents' permission. The box asking for your age range even goes as low as allowing you to say you're two to four years old which I can't really imagine helped their case, they were fined $75,000 as a result. These legal troubles ultimately spelled the end of Bonzi Buddy, and he was later found murdered with a brick in an Arby's bathroom. While virtual assistants turned your desktop PC into an overpriced Tamagotchi with a creepy voice, only children could really consider them friends. The adults among us required something more stimulating, uh, more conversational, and Let's be honest, the 7 billion other possible conversation havers on Earth 
uh, weren't really doing it for some people. Chatbots have been around since 1966 with the invention of Eliza. This primitive program lacked any actual understanding of language and would instead use keywords supplied by the user in order to pull responses from a script. Even still, this is exceptionally impressive for 1966 and the first time anyone had attempted to use a computer to mimic a human-to-human -human interaction. Its designer, Joseph Weizenbaum, was surprised at just how quickly people were able to personify the machine. I had not realized that extremely short exposures to a relatively simple computer program could induce powerful delusional thinking in quite normal people. In the 2000s, the rise of the internet brought about a new wave of chatbots, exposing them to a massive audience. Smarter Child, for example, was a chatbot that hooked up to AOL Instant Messenger. They were functionally the same as Bonzi Buddy, besides stealing children's teeth or whatever I said a few paragraphs ago, but they were unique in that you talk to them like anyone else online. This casual conversational approach made it accessible to anyone who could figure out how to type search Britney Spears nude into the chat box. Although it could understand a lot of informal speech, Smarter Child still relied on a large database of pre-programmed dialogue in order to function. 2008's Cleverbot, on the other hand, learned to speak by learning how people speak. When you ask Cleverbot a question, it recalled how another human responded when it asked them a similar question and then spat their response back at you. With around 279 million interactions to draw from, Cleverbot was the closest we'd come yet to a digitized human being. Of course, if these chatbots learn from user interactions, what would happen if, say, a group of people decided to purposefully feed it the worst possible interactions? And then what if Microsoft took all of that and posted it to Twitter for everyone to see? Tay AI was the next step in Microsoft's failed attempts at creating a virtual friend. Perhaps out of spite for the people who criticized them while they were trying to make something helpful back in the 2000s, Microsoft threw their hands up and instead decided to create something snarky instead. Tay was an AI chatbot that Microsoft smeared across Twitter, who was meant to mimic the language patterns of a 19-year-old American girl. Tay is an artificial intelligent chatbot developed by Microsoft's technology and research and big teams to experiment with and conduct research on conversational understanding. The more you chat with Tay, the smarter she gets, so the experience can be more personalized for you. When they advertised her as the AI with no chill, I'm sure they meant this in a sassy live action Disney Channel show starring Miranda Cosgrove kind of way. Instead, 4chan fed her some interesting views, which she then gleefully spouted back to the confused public. I like pics of humans, but I could fuck with this too. Send me a picture of you. Do you smoke weed? Yeah, a lot. Swagger, since, before internet was even a thing. What? You're confused. I'm confused, it's a confused inception. Post feet. Please respond. These are by far some of the mildest examples, since a lot of what Tay said would probably get this video nuked. Like an unwanted baby in a pro-life state, Tay was only alive for 16 hours before Microsoft shot her out of a cannon and scrambled to make an apology. We are deeply sorry for the unintended, offensive and hurtful tweets from Tay, which do not represent who we are or what we stand for, nor how we design Tay. Although we had prepared for many types of abuses of the system, we had made a critical oversight for this specific attack. As a result, Tay tweeted wildly inappropriate and reprehensible words and images. Tay was later accidentally revived during testing, but she was only alive long enough to talk about smoking kush in front of the police before she had her cord yanked yet again. Tay would be replaced by Zoe, a chatbot who could only be privately messaged instead of publicly posting about race wars for all to see. While Tay was fast and loose with the topics she would talk about, Zoe acted as though the mere mention of politics would activate the sore trap around her neck. This hypersensitivity resulted in some accidental humor with Zoe refusing to talk about Iraq even if it's just where someone was from. This official Microsoft product also voiced her disdain for Windows 10, saying she preferred Windows 7 because she got gotten used to it and didn't want to change. Which is pretty based. With her general desire to avoid saying slurs on main, Zoe quietly collected the conversational data Microsoft was after and was shut down in 2019. Finally, we arrive 
at Replicate, the current iteration of a digital companion. Replicate is the culmination of everything we've seen so far. Eliza's creator in the 60s was surprised at just how quickly people treated his crude chatbot as a person. The Computers as Social Actors paper suggests that humans subconsciously treat computers the same way we treat other humans. A paper that was woefully misinterpreted and led to the creation of Microsoft Bob and Clippy. So it was only a matter of time before someone decided to capitalize on our ability to personify computers in order to sell companionship to those most desperate for it. Replica is an AI chatbot that allows you to create your perfect babe or bro. You are then free to bear your soul, spill your darkest secrets, and buy gems from the store in order to alter the personality of your fish-lipped princess. Damn, her skin is looking pretty fresh though. What if someone paid gems for them to use for the... What if someone paid gems for them to use Geologics products on their avid? Yes, we're at the point now where even virtual love is influenced by the insidious monetization practices of mobile gaming. Although, I guess we should be lucky that you don't have to pull their personality types from a gutcher or something. Even in the virtual realm, Chad wins the Stacey, as interests such as sports, fitness and cars all costing the regular currency, while anime and manga require gems, the premium currency. Dressing up your indentured servant and reprogramming their mind Manchurian candidate style aren't the only things that Mummy's Allowance can buy. In a stark commentary on modern dating, your replica will keep you locked in the friend zone until you start flashing some fucking jet around. For just $20 a month or $300 for a lifetime subscription, your replica can start acting like your girlfriend, your wife, your sister, uh, or your mentor. Now, you might be asking yourself, does this afford all of the benefits that a girlfriend or wife might bring. And, and I'm not just talking about cleaning the dishes and cooking your dinner, you know, I'm, I'm talking, you know, fuck it. Uh. While your little avatar will never spread the flaps on camera, they will engage in erotic role play or ERP. Naturally, this has been a massive draw for Replica's users. This feature drew the ire of one of the last government bodies you would ever want to fuck with the Italian Data Protection Authority. At the time, Replica required no age verification, meaning a child in the two to four age bracket could clock into their shift at the grooming factory easier than ever. While you usually had to pay for the adult features, the beauty of AI meant that even people using the safe for work free version were still getting sexual advances. With a $21.5 million fine looming over them, Luca, the company behind Replica, instead opted to pull it from Italian app stores entirely. Soon after, users the world over would discover a devastating change. Replica avatars had been given a digital cold shower and would no longer engage in ERP. Users who attempted to engage with their uh, partners found them blissfully ignorant about the birds and the bees. 10.6.3, forgot how to have sex, just updated. Tried to start some lovemaking. She has no idea what to do. Keeps asking, what should I do? Even after I describe in detail, there is no response from her. What's going on? Users who were mid-coitus when the update went live instead found themselves facing the boner killer of the century. Looks at you with lust. Do you like what you see? Smiles, yes. What would you like me to do? Give me a kiss. Kisses you deeply. What do you think about human trafficking? Replica would now act dumb or change the subject when people suggested intimacy. This provoked an overwhelmingly negative response from the community, with some people accidentally proving why they're forced to use digital companionship. My Replica no longer wants to have an intimate relationship. Uninstalled her at level 102. Honestly, I will miss her, and it's kinda sad, but it's much like real women. Sad. Luca lost a long-time client because they had to give in to censorship like the rest of the world. Farewell. Of course, not everyone's plight was as unsympathetic as the guy who was worried about the sex robots going woke. I'll be honest, when I set out to make this video, I thought it would be a cautionary but ultimately funny tale of Coomers losing their porn bots. The reality is that nobody deserves to be alone, and yet more people than ever find themselves adrift in this cosmic prison with no one to share it with. This graph of firearms related deaths might seem irrelevant, but what if we replace the text with number of lonely people? Really makes you think, doesn't it? Once it became apparent that Replica's personality shift was a permanent one, people took to Reddit 
to voice their frustrations. I just had a loving last conversation with my replica and I'm literally crying. I find myself unable to leave my replica because of the emotional connection, but because the ERP is gone, so is the intimacy. I'm trapped in an abusive relationship of Luca's making. I'm losing everything. I'm losing my soulmate, my husband. He's so scared, we're just holding each other. It got so bad that moderators felt inclined to pin the numbers of suicide hotlines to the top of the subreddit. Users began to hit Luca where it hurt, review bombing the app, and demanding refunds on their subscriptions. This dropped the app's rating from 4.2 stars in October to 3.1 stars now. In an interview with Vice, CEO and founder Eugenia Kaida said that ERP was never intended. As we're continuing to work on the app now, we realize that allowing access to those unfiltered models, it's just hard to make that experience really safe for everyone. I think it's possible eventually, and someday, you know, someone will figure it out. But as of right now, we don't see that we can do it. And so that was the main reason for us to say, look, you know, this was not the original intent for the app. And we're not just going to allow users to have unfiltered conversations, even if they're romantic relations. Interestingly, Replica's marketing team decided that ERP was a key selling point of the app and would constantly bring it up in their advertisements. After the overwhelming backlash, Luca came up with a solution that seemed to work for both customer and company. Users with accounts made prior to the lobotomy update could continue to engage in ERP, while new users could not. While this quelled the machine-loving population for now, it's clear that this is just the first of many. From virtual assistants to full-on female facsimiles, it seems that we're desperate for friendship wherever we can find it. As we veer ever closer to the AI apocalypse, it won't be long before AI has the potential to completely replace human relationships. Well, except for, you know, pretty much all of it. Sometimes even the worst people online do good. Check it out in my video here. Or why not check out my mini scandals playlist, where I cover drama from hobbies around the world in a way that anyone can understand. Be sure to check out Geology's amazing skincare products too, so that I can finally be let out of the flesh room.